A really warm welcome for the final time to our home here at Quainton Rectory on this morning of celebration, Easter Sunday, the day that we celebrate together as Christians, Jesus Christ's resurrection. Uh, it's lovely to welcome you again into our home and we celebrate Easter uh, in solidarity with those of you who remain at home to worship. But of course you will see lovely glimpses of Tony Lemon as he preaches in church and leads into sessions and also Helen Brown and Christopher Fletcher Campbell who are going to be reading from us. So hopefully you'll have the best of both worlds. That reminder that some of us are continuing to stay at home to worship but also catching a lovely glorious glimpse of the inside of that special sacred space which we call St Peter's. So let's be quiet for a moment as we prepare to worship our Lord on this Resurrection Sunday. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Christ, yesterday and today, the beginning and, and the, the end, end, Alpha and Omega, all time belongs to him and all ages, to, to him be glory and power, power through every age and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. May the light of Christ, rising in glory, banish all darkness from our hearts and minds. The light of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. We say together, glory to God glory in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Now at this moment in the service, usually when we're in church, there's the blessing of the Easter garden. So in absence of an Easter garden in our sitting room, as I read the collect and as you pray through the words of the collect, we're going to have embedded on the screen a photograph of the garden tomb in Jerusalem. And hopefully that will just remind you of all those Easter Sundays when you've watched the blessing of the Easter garden. So let us pray. Let us pray that we may reign with the risen Christ in glory. God of glory, by the raising of your Son, you have broken the chains of death and hell. Fill your church with faith and hope, for a new day has dawned, and the way to life stands open in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. A reading from Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all the peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-matured wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-matured wines stained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all the peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. 
It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For the gift of the word, thanks, thanks be to, to God. God. The second reading is taken from the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 10. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. For the gift of the word, thanks, thanks be to God. Alleluia. I am the first and the last, says the Lord, and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Alleluia. Alleluia. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory, Glory to, to you, o Lord. o Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome, they brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. Christ. Alleluia, Alleluia. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. From Mark's Gospel. Uh, verse 7, chapter 16, But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. There was once a, a struggling church which involved a guest preacher, 
in the hope that he could inject new life into the congregation. And after the service, once one of the church wardens came up to the priest looking disappointed and said, Father, as a church warden, I was hoping that your sermon would excite our congregation. And the priest replied, you're right. I did say I could excite this congregation, but I didn't say I could raise them from the dead. Well, Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia. Today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, which is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Although there are variations in detail, the fact of the empty tomb is presented in all four Gospels. Accounts of Jesus' resurrection are given in Matthew, Luke and John, again with variations. In today's Gospel, the messenger in the tomb tells the women who have come to embalm and anoint Jesus' body with their spices not to be alarmed. He acknowledges their search for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, and simply states, he has been raised, he is not here, directing them to tell the other disciples and Peter, perhaps singling out Peter to emphasize that despite his denials uh, of Jesus, he's still very much one of the disciples. So he directs them to tell the disciples that Jesus is going ahead of them to Galilee. Small wonder that the women were seized with terror and amazement. Mark's Gospel comes to a sudden end there, but it may well be that the final part of an early scroll was mutilated and lost. John records Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene outside the tomb. Matthew and John go on to record appearances in Galilee, whilst for Luke, Jerusalem is the pivot to which Jesus journeys for his final ministry and death, where the risen Christ is seen and from whence the gospel spreads to the end of the earth. St. Paul bluntly tells the Corinthians, if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. Well, let's suppose for a moment or two that Jesus was and remains dead. Was Paul right, or can a worthwhile Christian faith survive without his resurrection? Death would, after all, not alter Jesus' actions or his teaching, and it would be perfectly possible to regard him with great respect, perhaps even to accept him as the greatest human being who has lived, who lived the loveliest life in his short time on earth. His life and teaching would still be worthy of study to achieve greater understanding. He could still be our pattern and example, a model for life. These are all hugely worthwhile things, and whilst falling short of full Christian faith, they can certainly have tremendously positive outcomes. For me, Paul's adm admonition to the Corinthians overstates the case although I do believe in the reality of the resurrection. I would also admit to the validity and effectiveness of the faith of some who find it difficult to accept that reality, at least in physical terms. But whether the Christian church would have survived, let alone grown and developed as it has without the reality of the resurrection, is quite another matter. Jesus had, of course, spoken of his own resurrection at various stages of his ministry, but there are some things that we hear and simply don't absorb because they seem to make no sense in terms of accepted ideas. Jesus' sayings on the subject were in this category. They made no sense in terms of the Jewish concept of resurrection, which was a large-scale event, a time when after Israel's great and final suffering, all God's people would be given new life in new bodies. Their way of thinking simply didn't allow for the concept of a single person being killed and raised to a new sort of bodily life beyond the grave. And for different reasons, and a very different cultural context, of course, in our world today, 
we too struggle with this concept. Central to Luke's account is the scepticism of the disciples when the women bring them the message of the empty tomb. These words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. It's Peter, as ever the man of action, who gets up and runs to the tomb. But when the women's story is confirmed, he goes home amazed at what had happened. This scepticism continues through the resurrection appearances where there's repeatedly a need to be persuaded. So in Matthew's story of the appearance on the mountain in Galilee, some doubted and hung back. In John, both Mary Magdalene and Peter fail at first to recognize the risen Christ. In his first appearance to the disciples in the upper room, Jesus has to show them his hands and his feet, and he asks for something to eat, eating a piece of grilled fish, as if to demonstrate the physical reality of his presence among them. Most famously of all, of course, Thomas, who had been absent the first time, forcefully expresses his doubts and has to be convinced by physical evidence. The whole tradition which emerges from these accounts shows that belief in the resurrection was no pushover. It had to be impressed on the frightened survivors of Jesus' band of followers. If the Gospel writers have been making up this story a generation or more after the event, as people sometimes suggest, surely they would have told it very differently. They wouldn't have had Women going first to the tomb, probably, because women were not regarded as credible witnesses in biblical times. And they surely wouldn't have had the apostles so doubtful, so full of doubt and scepticism. They would have had the apostles believe the story at once. Why emphasize disbelief and doubt at the empty tomb and in the resurrection appearances if the story is fabricated? Paradoxically, this very tradition of doubt seems to lend authenticity to the Gospel accounts. But the ultimate reality of the resurrection is not to be found in analysis of the biblical texts, important as that is. More critical, I think, is the evidence of what happened to the disciples themselves. Their despondency was transformed. First disbelieving, then puzzled, then filled with joy. It was a transformation from bewilderment to understanding, from rejection and abandonment into a certain hope, from death to life, from despair to joy. It was a transformation sufficient to enable the disciples to undertake the very mission for which Jesus had prepared them, so strengthened that against what must have appeared overwhelming odds, they not only kept the flame of the new Christian faith alive, but succeeded in spreading it sufficiently for it to continue and flourish, growing and spreading, even in the face of persecution, into the worldwide church that we know today. Jesus told his followers that they would be his witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, in this respect, our reading from Acts this morning makes, marks a critical landmark as Peter brings the Christian faith to the Gentiles and to Romans for the first time when he addresses the centurion Cornelius and his family and friends in Caesarea. Not perhaps the ends of the earth uh, geographically, but a much shorter cultural step much closer cultural step to everywhere in the known world at the time. Such was the effectiveness of these early foundations that the reality of the resurrection is ongoing in the hearts and minds of millions of people today who seek to find in Jesus more than a fine example, more than a model or perfect pattern, but a living presence to help us to know how to live. We all strive imperfectly in that search, dogged by doubts and difficulties, 
but we strive nonetheless in the belief that the object is real and that it's worth striving for. The opening mood of the first Easter morning was one of surprise, astonishment, fear and confusion, even among those who had lived with Jesus and heard his words. We can take comfort from this as we continue to struggle ourselves with the nature and meaning of the resurrection. Unlike the disciples, we have the wisdom of hindsight, but there's a sense in which the very continuation of these inner struggles makes Easter always a surprise, whether we meet it as now in celebrating the feast itself or in surges of God's grace in our own lives or in the wider world. I should like to end with some words by uh, a Roman Catholic theologian, Henry Wandsborough, once master of St. Bennet's Hall here in Oxford. The briefest possible prayer, but it seems to me that every phrase is laden with meaning. Lord, grant me an openness to your word, but also a firm scepticism. Give me a strong faith that help me to avoid the credulity which reduces your saving truths to silliness and brings contempt upon your generosity. Amen. In baptism, God calls us out of darkness into his marvellous light. To follow Christ means dying to sin and rising to new life with him. Therefore, I ask, do you turn to Christ? I turn to Christ. Do you repent of your sins? I repent of my sins. Do you renounce evil? I renounce evil. Brothers and sisters, I ask you to profess the faith of the church. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? I believe, I believe and, and trust, trust in him. him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known to the world? I, I believe, believe and trust, trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This, this is, is our faith. faith. We, we believe and trust in one God, Father, Father Son and, and Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. You may be relieved you won't be getting wet today, uh, but this is a wonderful reminder of our own baptisms and the promises that were made on our behalf that we confirmed ourselves. So together we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for our fellowship in the household of faith with all those who have been baptised in your name. Keep us faithful to our baptism and so make us ready for that day when the whole creation shall be made perfect in your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you may be rooted and grounded in love, and bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ is risen today, our triumphant holy day. As we emerge from the dark pathway of Lent into the sunlight of Easter day, let us give thanks for Jesus' assurance that death is the gate to life immortal. Let us rejoice in this yearly celebration of his triumph and pray that we may commit ourselves to keeping it holy until the end of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Who did once upon the cross suffer to redeem our loss? On this triumphant holy day, we give thanks that Jesus once endured cross and grave so that for all time sinners should be redeemed. Let us hold before God all those who, especially in these recent difficult months, have endured trouble, sorrow, need or sickness, 
and pray that by grace we may all feel the comfort of the resurrection and know that our salvation has been procured through the cross of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us give thanks for the worldwide church and pray for its peace and unity. Let us pray for seekers who may feel their spiritual longings unsatisfied by the rituals and ceremonies and doctrines that they find in some churches. Easter is everyone's festival. May they, too, find joy in the risen Jesus. Internationally, we pray for all who face hostility and persecution. We pray for all victims of state-sponsored violence or terrorist activity and for refugees and asylum seekers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us give thanks for our local community, praying for all those who have felt especially isolated and alone, that better weather, longer days and friends in gardens will cheer them. And we give thanks for all those who have worked to support them in this time of particular need, whether because they are indeed next-door neighbours or because they have at heart Jesus' response to the lawyer's question, who is my neighbour? At Easter, as we look back over a year of recorded services and emailed updates, let us give thanks for all that our ministry team has done to keep us both safe and church, and for Val, who has worked so hard for us all. As daffodils, emerging peonies, camellias, explosive forsythia excite our gardens and hedgerows, we give thanks for God's creation and our environment. Let us pray that we may be supportive of all that can be done to reduce the damage that we are doing to our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Amongst those who have asked for our prayers, we pray for Vicky Shepston. Jean Tuffley, Lynn Dean, Gordon Killy, John Stephen, Christine Kennedy, Russell Irvin, Grace and Harry Logan. Michael Stockford is also on this list, and as we pray for Michael, let us also pray for Rita and give thanks for them both as they begin their 71st year of marriage. We remember with thanksgiving those who have died during the past year, whether as a result of COVID or not, praying especially now for the families and friends of David Burden and Joan Smith, who have recently died. Let us take a moment to think of earlier Easter's of those we shared them with and whom we see no longer. Amongst those of this parish who died about this time in earlier years, we remember Mick Horst, Margaret Bolt, Eileen Crompton, Molly Mitchell, Joseph Birch, Donald Broadbent. Finally, on her last Sunday with us, let us give heartfelt thanks for Sarah's ministry at St Peter's and All Saints, for her patience and kindness, for her amazing energy, for her wisdom, for her good humour during bad times, and pray for her and for Steve as she moves on to the new congregation's enabler for the diocese. Now above the sky, he's king where the angels ever sing. Alleluia. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
the risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then they were glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Alleluia. Let's share a sign of peace together. Peace be with you, darling. Peace be with you. Lord of life, with joy we offer you our sacrifice of praise. As we are fed with the bread of heaven, may we know your resurrection power through Christ our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, almighty and eternal Father. And on this day of our redemption, to celebrate with joyful hearts the memory of your wonderful works. For by the mystery of his passion, Jesus Christ, your risen Son, has conquered the powers of death and hell, and restored in men and women the image of your glory. He has placed them once more in paradise and opened to them the gate of life eternal. And so, in the joy of this Passover, earth and heaven resound with gladness, while angels and archangels and the powers of all creation sing forever the hymn of your glory. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice, made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with blessed Mary Peter and all the saints, to feast at your table in heaven, through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Rejoicing in God's new creation, let us pray with confidence, as our Saviour has taught us. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Lord, our hearts hunger for you. Give us this bread always. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. 
Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. feast. Alleluia. Alleluia. The body of Christ. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. God of life, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection had delivered us from the power of our enemy. Grant us so to die daily to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his risen life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. So just before we close the service with a blessing and the dismissal, I wanted to say thank you so much to all of you for the incredible warm welcome that you've given us. I've served among you as an interim minister. Um, I did feel very clearly called to come to St Peter's and All Saints Whiteham. Uh, it was a calling uh, that was a surprise to me in a way because it's such a different churchmanship uh, to my own background of being evangelical charismatic. But I can honestly say from the heart that it's been a privilege. It was a privilege to serve alongside Charles and to enable him to fulfil and to complete uh, the vision that he felt God had given him, serving alongside. And now, of course, through this extraordinary time of COVID lockdown, just working with the other ministry team and the wider team of wardens and Anne, our, ch our children and families worker, and Julia as administrator and many more, just serving together with you not just struggling to keep the show on the road, but actually continuing in our worship week by week. So thank you for welcoming me for this time. And I'm very excited that uh, just as we speak this week, there's been the shortlisting of the candidates that have applied. And I'm immensely hopeful for you that uh, it won't be too long before you have a new incumbent. And I look forward to meeting him or her in due course. And of course, as ever, the welcome is to all of you. If ever you're up this way in Quainton, come and see where the filming takes place. You're always welcome uh, for a cup of tea or something to eat at our table. And equally, I shall keep in touch with you as I serve in my new diocesan post as New Congregations Enabler. And I'm sure that I will maintain contact uh, through my new role, but with you as friends as well. And I should just say a huge thank you to Steve who particularly in this time of lockdown has done so much to help us in recording these services, working with Val and doing many more things behind the scenes when you've been keeping your own churches going as well. When are your churches opening? Well, we're opening here at Quainton and my other parish church in Oving on May the 23rd, which is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, quite appropriate because we recognise that as the birth of the church and the Acts of the Apostles. So it's a rebirth here as well which we'll celebrate together. Mm, exciting. Well thank you darling for all that you've done and I know I'd like to thank you on behalf of our churches for thank serving. You. We love working together, we've always worked together in some capacity so it's been lovely to be able to do that uh, in this particular ministry. 
So my love and my prayers I leave with you as I have the privilege of pronouncing a final blessing. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. God the Father, by whose love Christ was raised from the dead, open to you who believe the gates of everlasting life. Amen. Amen. And God the Son, who in bursting forth from the grave has won a glorious victory, give you joy as you share the Easter faith. Amen. Amen. And God the Holy Spirit, who filled the disciples with the life of the risen Lord, empower you and fill you with Christ's peace. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, remain with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. With the risen life of Christ within you, go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.